I won't kid myself that you're here to see me. It was just the free food and wine. Um, I'd do the same thing. Um, so I just thought I'd kind of begin by actually kind of saying, because most people, when they find out what my career is, um, the first question is, well, where's your crystal ball? Um, and then secondly, it is also, oh, but have you heard about this new restaurant, which obviously I don't know about? And then they kind of think, not much of a trend forecaster, are you? Um, and then they obviously want their own personal fortune most of the time read as well. And I think it's one of those things where the future is something that we're consistently preoccupied by. Um, I was just at a, uh, sitting on a panel for Commonwealth Bank last week, and one of the other panelists was all talking about future-proofing. We have to future-proof everything. Um, I don't believe that at all, actually, because I, I can't get you guys to raise your hand tomorrow. It doesn't exist. It's just this. And the more that we actually be here in this, the greater capacity we have to build the futures that actually inspire. So if I kind of work back a little bit and kind of say, and in regards to when people kind of um, try to trip me up by asking if I know these trends, which I know nothing about, I always say it is really about being the librarian and not the library. And um, I think that's some of the best advice I actually give to my corporate clients. Um, to me, a trend is always an unmet need, and it's always an emotion. And because most people don't look for the emotion, it's why they can't find the trend. So we might see um, a restaurant that becomes really popular and hot and buzzy at the moment, and we just think, oh, it must be the menu. Or then we might go, no, it must be the chef. And then we go, it must be the decor. And then we go, it must be the location. But I suspect it's probably just meeting the emotional need for belonging. You know, that's kind of there. So it's always actually first actually understanding the unmet need and what is the emotion. Um, it's why sometimes we study drug culture, because it's actually what people aren't getting in this day, at this moment, they're actually actively kind of seeking. And the trend is always, it's the disconnect. It's always the disconnect. And that's where I kind of live in that kind of realm. Um, I... I don't speak in a linear fashion, and I'll speak about that a little bit kind of later, but just rest assured, it, it will all kind of make sense in the end. And I always kind of say, I don't know if you've heard that saying um, by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is, the sign of insanity is being able to hold two opposing viewpoints in the mind at the same time and not go insane. I kind of sometimes say that's my job, not to go insane. Um, and it's about how can you hold all these things. And um, once I actually did have to present to Murdoch, James Murdoch, and um, I was telling him about the future of travel, and I said in one breath, I said, you know, everyone wants to be Captain Cook, they want to be an explorer. And in the next breath, I said, but we all want to travel with our media cocoons and like, you know, cashmere blankets and candles that remind us of home. And he's like, Christina, you're contradicting yourself. And I'm like, I'm not because it's all about context. If you don't have context, there's no relevance, and if there's no relevance, there's no right to exist. And that's the thing, it's all about how do you find that emotional unmet need and deliver it actually in context. Um, and so a lot of the times it's like, how can you exist in that, in that continent? And I think it's always between, you know, the amateur and, uh, or the apprentice and the master, the embryonic, embryonic and the fully formed. And I think a lot of the times we either are on one extreme of those, those parallels on the continent, but it's actually, it's a dance. It's like, how do you exist within both of them, both at the same time? So, as I said, a trend's an unmet need, it's always an emotion, um, but I also don't believe in one singular idea. I don't believe there is no one new idea. I really only believe in new combinations. And so many of my clients just say, Christina, we want the big idea. Like, what's that one big idea that's going to get us on the front page of the New York Times or that we can build a business on? I say, it's not that, it's just a new combination. So where do these new combinations come from? Well, there's three different types of knowledge that I work with. The first one is um, the abstract knowledge. It's, it's about it's an arts degree. For those of you that ever did an arts degree, it's valuable. Um, uh, and it's about that thinking which is, you know, um, beekeeping, Egyptian mummification, dates on the English society calendar, all the things that people deem irrelevant. It's that aspect of it, that generalized abstract knowledge. The second piece of knowledge I deal with is the specific. Most people really struggle with that because, you know, we have the, the brains of ants that have attention spans of nanoseconds now. I mean, a lot of the research that's kind of coming out at the moment is when you're on Facebook and you're looking at, a, at your feed and then also, also on the page. It's as destructive to the brain cells as smoking marijuana. And uh, most people just do not have the ability to focus their attention. And just as an aside, I'm very fortunate I get to interview most of the top CEOs around the world, and um, what I really learned that the two most successful criteria is, one is focus. There is nothing more important than focus. When you have focus, you have this laser-like beam that burns through any distractions, and it's a bit like that saying, remove the unnecessary so the necessary 
you may speak. And the second is timing. There's absolutely nothing more important than timing. And I'll speak a bit that, uh, about that a little bit later when I speak about kind of rhythm. So it's again the ability to have the abstract knowledge the specific knowledge, and the third type of knowledge is the intuitive. I dwell in the land of intuition. Um, most of you will probably be frightened by that word. Um, I have a brother who has a PhD in a very uh, specific form of science, doesn't like me going near that kind of word. Um, our Christmases are very fun, as you can imagine. Um, and I think it's one of those things that, to me, intuition runs at a faster rate than the intellect. Um, I always kind of use the analogy of, would you prefer to rely on the mind of just that existed within your desktop computer, or would you like to exist within the universal mind, which is more like the World Wide Web? I'd choose the World Wide Web any day. Um, and so I think it's one of those things that I'm very, very fortunate because I started off working for the best, and because of that, uh, which was, I started with a hypothesis, and then these companies allowed me, which was my intuition, to then spend the budget that they gave me and to research my hypothesis. I never, ever, ever start from the research and end up with a hypothesis. There is no future born there. And that is the way that I see most people innovating. They go off and we're going to go do some trends research. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do trends research. And then we'll get a hypothesis at the end of it. It doesn't work that way. It begins with a hypothesis, and that's your intuition. So it's about how these three forms of knowledge all work together. And it then becomes like a kaleidoscope. So if you can imagine, like you're just consistently forming it, consistently to see what are the new pathways, what are the new combinations that exist there. But also what exists within that is this idea that you know, to get creativity, because that's almost like what most corporations are after at the moment, is it's proximity plus diversity. And let me explain that as the algorithm. So diversity is diversity in thought. And most of us don't actually have that, because most of us don't even go to a coffee shop that's across the road from us, or go to a suburb, or speak to someone from a different background from us. You know, I think there's some saying, I think it's the statistic is um, something like over 50% of the lower houses members of parliament in the UK went to either Harrow or Eton. Um, I won't mention what that would be in Adelaide and schools here. But if you can just imagine that you're always consistently drawing on that same kind of stock, it's a bit like there are trend forecasting websites where you can go to, but I'm like, why would you pull on that when your competitors and everybody else is pulling on that? Um, you know, for me, I always kind of say the only competition is the old way of doing things. And so whenever I do benchmarking or a client wants me to benchmark, I never do in that same industry. It's ridiculous. Um, I, I find it always hilarious, you know, a car manufacturer wants to benchmark against other car manufacturers, or a state would want to benchmark against other states, because they actually haven't seen that, understood that it's actually the new combinations and that, that actually would lead to the innovation, not the same old, same old. If you always do the same old, that's what you're actually going to get within the future. And so when you kind of actually look at, okay, diversity of thought, and most of us don't allow ourselves to go there because we, we won't open up a newspaper um, from another uh, country or we write, might not read a magazine that we're not interested in. I very, very frequently will go to a newspaper, a news agency, and pick up car, like things that I've got no interest in, gardening, mag like car magazines, things like that. And actually, when I'm reading, out of the disinterest, there'll be themes that actually start resonating to me. And I think that's the really interesting thing about trends. As I said, it's not one big idea. It's about you overhear a conversation in a restaurant, you're on a plane, you read something in the Financial Times, you then read about some new patent that's being filed. And the trick is to be able to kind of follow that red kind of thread through. So an example of that could be, say, um, this trend that we have for transparency. Well, we could look at, say, you know, sushi kitchens coming out to Australia. And all of a sudden, the kitchen went from being in the back to being in the front. And then all of a sudden, we've got Enron. And that brought in a certain level of transparency within corporate governance. And then we might say, wow, the internet and everything that that does with price comparison, we have to be transparent in, in pricing. Then you might look at, what's happening in Paris on the cat floor with some translucent fabrics or in um, sensitive um, in, and intelligent textiles. And you start seeing, being able to, um, Daniel Pink in his book, A Whole New Mind, calls it synthesizing. How do you take all these disparate sets of data and make them whole? It's a really great book. If anyone wants to read that, I really recommend it. And, and that's really the skill. As I said, most people can't exist within the disparate sets of data because they actually see them as being in conflict. And then beyond that, they can't actually be able to see where the thread actually lies within them to link them all kind of up together. Um, so because we don't actually have the diversity in our thinking, um, and also we don't actually have the proximity, and it's what Google does, is that they throw into the tiniest little kind of room, you know, a poet plus an engineer plus the 
the technology person with an anthropologist with the CEO plus the cleaner, almost in the size of a broom cupboard, and say, sort it out. But most of us wouldn't even cross the room at a cocktail party to talk to someone that looks different than us. And we wonder why we don't have creativity. Another person's work that I really, really admire in this, this, this field is a lady by the name of Dr. Brené Brown. And she does a lot of work around shame and vulnerability. Um, and her, she's done two amazing TED Talks. And um, a lot of companies hire her because they want to know about creativity and innovation. And she said, before you know that, you must understand uh, vulnerability, because without that, you can't access the creativity or the innovation. And even before the vulnerability, the shame. Um, and that's another aspect of my work that I think is really, really key, which a lot of people don't look at, is we have this idea of, and I must also say, I don't actually believe in the word innovation. I actually prefer ingenuity. Um, and also, a lot of the times when people do brand values, they're actually nouns or adjectives and not verbs. How can you create something if it's not in motion? Um, uh, it's just stagnant. Um, but I would be looking at, you know, whether it's something like the state brand, which is, you know, say, um, creative and innovative and industrious. You first actually have to look at how you're uncreative or unoriginal or sterile in your thinking before you can actually embrace the creative. You must understand the shadow to be able to then integrate it with the light, to have an integrated solution. And most of us don't want to see that. So we're all for the light of innovation and the state of innovation, but we're actually not looking at how we're actually retarding it, because you first have to understand that before you can actually go forward. Um, so within that, if I kind of then kind of um, have a look at, well, how do I kind of work with clients? How does that, um, how does, uh, what would a project kind of look like? And just a very simple thing I always do, say if um, a bank asked me what the future of finance is, I would then always use the um, example of just kind of saying, well, why don't we actually design the bank that puts you out of business? And this is the way a lot of companies operate. They actually kind of say, okay, right, Let's just take Bendigo Bank as an example. We would actually create the bank that would put Bendigo out of business. And what would you do? You might say, well, we wouldn't actually have any retail outlets. And um, actually, um, why don't we create our own currency? And um, why don't we offer sabbaticals? Because that's kind of more the loans that people are all after. You would actually engineer yourself out of business. What the bigger companies then do is they actually spin off and create that company, and then that company subsumes the original one that asked the question. Harder, though, to do is embody the values and ideas and mindsets of this new kind of beast. But I think that if the one thing that I can impress on you that I've actually learned through, through my, my, my decade plus in this kind of field, which is you almost have to take yourself to the ideal first, and most of us don't go there. The reason most things actually fail is because we compromised before we even began. And so it's being able to kind of be the dreamer. Uh, you know, I was told off at school for being a dreamer, but it's the thing that saves me at the moment. It's like, in an ideal world, what would the solution look like? And it's not like, well, we don't have any money, and John hates Jane, and there's an election coming up, and do you know, all those kind of things that kind of stop it and get it in the way, but it's like, dream the ideal, and then you work back from that. It's like, shoot for the, you know, shoot forward, and then kind of work yourself way back. Because if you just inch your way forward, that's all you'll ever do. The future is something that when you can actually see it, it becomes so compelling that basically it draws you to it. Well, the way that most people are innovating is kind of like the, this, this, this march and innovation moves further and further away because it's just like riddled in fear um, and it hasn't actually got the emotional component within it. And that's what I think a really great visionary actually does, which is I actually believe... Um, it's not it's not fate and it's not um, free will. It's where both kind of collide. It's where fate meets destiny. It's where the road kind of meets the rubber. And it's one of those things that the why timing is so important. I, how many people have had amazing ideas, but the timing just wasn't kind of right? I mean, I know for myself, I can't play the stock market. I've learned to my detriment. I'm too far ahead. I can actually probably, in a presentation tomorrow, um, give you my, my work from 2006 and you'll say, excellent, it's brilliant. Um, because the thing is, is you actually have to have something that exists in the public lexicon for people to first kind of hook into. And that's why it's like, you know, do you want to be the, 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 you know, the explorer, the first one that kind of discovers uncharted land? Or do you want to be one of the captains of the first ships kind of that are settling out after the first exploration? And it's one of those things, you know, what's that saying that it all depends about what kind of leader or you want to be? Is that the maverick one? 
uh, there's all these different types of archetypes that exist. And if I can just say something about, you know, I'm fascinated not only by time. I don't believe in time management. I just believe in energy focus, um, which is difficult for a lot of my clients to get their head around. Um, but also in regards to space. So if you look at the, the way America innovates, there is such a large land mass. If they mess up, there's still room to build again. But if you look at Japan, there's so little land mass to, to work with that basically they have to have incremental innovation. There's no other way. Coupled then with all the cultural background, which is, uh, I lived in Tokyo for a couple of years, um, and, and so it's a basically, you know, you would never, even if you stood in the shadow of the samurai, your head would get cut off, so you never kind of question. You don't make those big kind of leaps. It's a bit like in America. There's still so much oil in the ground for them to get out. They only inter like innovate when the backs are up against the wall. And most of us don't do any of this kind of work about what exists in the ether. We don't do anything about the cultural kind of work when we kind of innovate. And that's why I hesitate to say we stagnate. Um, I'm trying to get, okay, I'm conscious of time. So I'll move on to what my current love is, which is rhythm. And um, I, I mean, I still do trends because that's what I'm known for. But um, it, it really came apparent to me that trends are just a, a very, um, it can be a highly subjective way to, to interpret a future. Um, what was far more interesting, because I was studying all you know, the economic cycles and patterns of behavior, was wow, the, it's ridiculous for us to think that the economy could be on a constant upward trajectory when the world is cyclical. You can look at a butterfly, you can look at us as humans, we already know that through businesses, through peaks and troughs. And as it's one of those things I always get so funny when people say, the mining boom or the drought, and it's like, like it hasn't ever happened before. These are cyclical kind of activities and it's because we don't actually know how to read the patterns that exist within nature. And that's really now what most of my work, work is all about, is working with companies to read the patterns of energy and the rhythms that kind of exist. So there's this saying that says, you cannot break the laws of nature, only yourself against them. And that's really basically what we're doing at the moment. If you do not design within the grand or operating design and principles of life, you will fail. There is just absolutely no other way. And so rhythm is, to me, I see rhythms as patterns of energy. Um, I see them that each of these rhythms actually have a wisdom uh, and almost a present windows or moments of time for us to, um, to create through. And I focus on four rhythms, uh, seasonal, tidal, lunar, and circadian. And for me, I don't actually study them as natural phenomenon but as emotional abstract and metaphors so for me the seasonal rhythm is all about acceptance which is you know you have to be 39 before you're 40 I don't know anyone that can jump from 38 to 41 I don't know anybody that can make it winter at the moment you know it's you have to live the season and I really learned this living in Tokyo it, it's not about being on time it's how do you exist within time because your intuition can only reach you in the present moment and most of us are not in the present moment at the moment. Uh, we're either worrying about the, you know, what happened in the past or trying to retrofit something or dreaming of what we're going to eat once this lady stops talking. Um, and so we're never actually here. And so when you're not actually here, you are, and I'll, when I speak about the tide, I'll speak, mention that, you miss the timing. So the timing is always there, but it's you that keeps missing it. Uh, but we always blame the time being wrong and off. I find that quite funny. So for me, the seasons are all about acceptance and greater presence. And we can see that now, obviously, with this introduction of seasonal food um, in regards to that they present these brief windows of time that will never be repeated. Like Thomas Merton said, this day will never come again. But it's also about the temporiness, the fragility of life. And also, most common times when I work with companies, uh, they are not willing to accept either a failure in product innovation, a failure of leadership. There is absolutely no acceptance whatsoever. And um, I was back in Japan, I think one year it was after the uh, tsunami, and um, I, I, I don't actually hold great hope for Japan in one sense, because at the year anniversary, the emperor and the empress, they acknowledged the tsunami and the earthquake, but they didn't acknowledge the nuclear fallout. If you, a phoenix cannot rise from the ashes, you have to have total acceptance. And most of us are just w not willing to go there with our corporations um, and in our work. And it's only through that level of acceptance can you build and kind of grow. When I look at the circadian, the circadian rhythm, that's what happens on a 24 hour basis, is probably one of the ones that's most important to corporations. Because again, everyone always thinks it's gonna be some big, grand, dramatic gesture that saves them. It's not, it's actually what you do on a habitual kind of basis. It's like Plato said, you are your habits. Um, 80 
content of the memory of an experience comes from the entry or, and the exit point. So if we look at a restaurant, how you're shown to the restaurant, to your table, and then how the bill is kind of given to you, that almost is almost the bookend of the experience. But we have bookends within how we kind of begin our day. But because most of us actually don't see anything from day or night, we don't whisk, witness dawn or dusk, um, usually we're asleep for the first one and in office towers for the second, it's almost like we don't know how to exist in a pace that isn't just on or off. Um, and it's interesting when you actually look at 24-hour cycles of what you can actually create. And I think I'd advise you tomorrow to just uh, when you go wake up, go, I've got a 24-hour cycle to create. What am I going to do within this? The thing that's most important about the circadian rhythm is for me, when I read it, I read it as about being about congruency and alignment. And this is where most corporations are falling down at the moment. It's why retail is struggling, because they've lost control of their supply chain. Uh, do you know? Um, and it's all about how do you actually, what you think, what you feel, and what you say become one. We see that with all the work in the environmental field at the moment. It's just greenwashing. So I think that's one of the key, key aspects of it, because congruency is how companies break themselves, uh, being incongruent. Um, when I look at kind of the moon, the moon for me is three things. It's about reflection, phasing, and pacing. Um, most of us don't build in time to our days to contemplate or reflect. It's always like, go, 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 go. And then we, we, we find ourselves doing the same project like we were doing the other day or a year ago because we haven't actually built in the learnings from it. It's also about pace. Um, you know, I've been away for 13 years. I came back last year. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'd laid great pace of life, I, you know. But it's not. Everyone's running around like it's urgent and a disaster and they've got coffee cups all to the lips trying to be all very important. And I'm one of those type of people that if you don't have time for a coffee, you just don't have your coffee, you know, because well, people don't know how to exist within pace. And I, I talk a lot about this term called il tempo giusto. Apologies to any Italians in the crowd. Um, but it means at the appropriate pace. It's 66 to 76 on the metronome, which is the beat of the human heart. That's the objective interpretation. Subjective is that the, music, the musician uses their own intuition to garner at which the pace, the mu piece of music should be played. Most of us, do, uh, our environment is outpacing us. And that is a really fascinating thing to kind of explore at the moment in the field of innovation, or ingenuity, as I like to say. And when we look at phasing, most people don't know how to run short-term goals on parallel with long-term objectives. If you look at the moon, it doesn't go from new to full overnight. There's a process. Uh, you can't move a car from, like, you know, first to fifth gear. There's phases that you actually have to go through. And most of us don't actually adequately build those phases in when we're actually trying to bring and deliver the future through. Um, and finally, if I look at the tide, you know, the tide for me is all about that effortlessness and kind of and the, and the flow and connecting to the stillness that powers the wave, not the superfluousness and the noise of the, the top of the wave. And I always kind of say, people say, what's the, 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 the advice or that you, you give your clients? And I say, silence. And um, it's why I found that, you know, in Japan, you, so many Westerners do not succeed there because, you know, they don't know how when there's a gap in thinking or gap in talking in a business negotiation, they don't know what to do. They get really nervous and they go, Bleh, and they just spill all their trade secrets. <laughs> they don't know how to be still in their own mind. And I really believe that, you know, music actually is made up between the space between notes, um, just as creativity exists in the space between thoughts. Um, and, and so it's about how often can we dwell in that space to be able to bring futures through. Um, and there's, a, there's no one singular future, I must also say. There's also there's multiples, but we'll save that one for another time. Um, when I kind of, what I look at happen, what's happening and how the tide reflects today is that information overload. Everybody is trying to catch every single kind of wave at the moment. And, I, you know, it's like um, Tony Schwartz in his book, The Energy Paradox, talks about, I think there's only like seven big decisions you'll make in your life. And if every day you're frittering away, should I have a cappuccino or a latte? When one of the big seven come, you're nowhere to be found. And that's kind of what I find. My consciousness or where I'm placing my awareness is when I look at a wave on a swell that hasn't formed yet. The advertiser is writing about the, the crash of the wave on the shore right now. Um, and it's almost one of those things that how do you know which wave has your, your name for it? Which one do you paddle and which one do you kind of let go right through you? And because at the moment all of us were trying to keep up to date with everything and know everything and again be the library and not the librarian, well the wave that then has our name on it, someone else catches it and rides it to the market with an IPO of 500 million. We're nowhere to be found. We're just flailing all around. And that's because we've lost the art of how to be discerning. Um, and so for me, I really, rhythm is fundamental to life. It's the pattern of nature. All things exist within, uh, within this pattern, this, with this rhythm. And really that's my mission or I feel my work at the moment is to 
there's three ways I kind of teach around that. The first was, or three components of it, I'll just say, is the awareness. A lot of people are not aware of the rhythmical component of life. Um, they go, rhythm? And they go, oh, yeah, and then you go, oh, the seasons, the tide, they, they, they have no awareness. And then when they realize that, they go, oh, I want to align with that because success requires energy. But when you're fighting the natural rhythm of life, uh, you know, you're exhausted and you take a Red Bull or a caffeine to kind of put you to keep you kind of going, you're almost, you're actually out of harmony. Any business that is not succeeding, and even in your own life, you're out of rhythm, you're out of sync. You just don't know what you're out of sync to. These rhythms, I must say, are happening with or without your knowledge. But where the true power comes, and the true visionaries, and the ones that I work with, are the ones that consciously align with these rhythms. Because it's not you individually bringing the sun up and down each day, unless I'm mistaken. But a lot of the times we look at our to-do list and we think we are that powerful. I wish. Um, and it's about being, how do you then consciously align with it instead of unconsciously be at the mercy of them? And so it's very much about, first, you have to be aware of these rhythms that exist within business and within life. And then you actually have to look at, well, if they're happening naturally, what am I doing to block it? What am I doing as the barrier to it? So it's the dismantling of it before you can then actually move to the third step, which is the embracing and the embodiment of it. And as I said, it's also a lot of the, about the work of being able to understand the shadow side of what you're trying to create, not just the light of it or the positive side, to be able to bring a truly integrated whole solution kind of through. So I might just leave you there with that thought, but if I, if, as a trend forecaster or the, the futurist, if I can say anything, I really believe the future is rhythm.